Guadalajara cartel, using the roads of Guadalajara to send drugs to the United States, especially marijuana. A DEA agent named Enrique Kiki Camarena was also kidnapped, tortured, and killed. The Guadalajara cartel was once considered one of the most powerful cartels in all of Mexico. But everything changed when Caro Quintero, one of the cartel's most ruthless leaders, made the biggest mistake of his life. On February 7, 1985, Quintero ordered the kidnapping, torture, and brutal murder of Special Agent Enrique Camarena, leading to one of the largest investigations ever conducted by the DEA and putting an end to the cartel's reign of torture. Today, we explore the dark history of the Guadalajara cartel and the brave agent who finally burned their empire to the ground, the Mexican cartel. The history of the global drug trade is a story filled with suspense, emotions, and heart-wrenching moments. Did you know that the 1980s and early 1990s were the golden age of the drug trade? But hidden under the surface of this brutal world lies a tale of unyielding pursuit and justice. This is the story of Enrique Kiki Camarena, an undercover DEA agent who dared to investigate the operations of the cartel, paying the ultimate price with his blood. The outcome of this operation was the downfall of one of Mexico's most notorious drug cartels. Cartels and criminal organizations have plagued Mexico for decades, becoming deeply rooted in its criminal underworld. It's almost become a ritual, you see, for these organizations to compete for dominance in the smuggling industry, battling for control of territories and routes. Just when one cartel is eliminated, another rises to power to show how serious and bonded these fraternities were. It's a never-ending cycle of violence and power struggles. And in the heart of it all was the Guadalajara Cartel, a name that may not ring a bell for many today, but it once reigned supreme in the drug trafficking world. Let's take a closer look at some key figures that shaped the Guadalajara Cartel. Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, Rafael Caro, and Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo. These were the men who built the infamous cartel, using the roads of Guadalajara to transport drugs, especially marijuana, to the United States. But among these names, one stands out. Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo is a man who defined modern-day criminal organizations. Born in the countryside of Sinaloa, Mexico, Felix Gallardo initially pursued a career in law enforcement. Can you imagine how different his life could have been if he had stayed on the right side of the law? But fate had other plans. During his time as a bodyguard for a governor, Felix Gallardo used his position to establish political connections and build his drug trafficking empire. He began by arranging bribes for government officials, partnering up with Caro and Fonseca Carrillo, who had connections to the AES criminal organization. When the AES leader was eliminated, Felix Gallardo and his partners took over the drug trafficking routes, co-founding the Guadalajara cartel between 1978 and 1980. And that's when things started to change. Marijuana farms emerged in desert areas, using a potent strain called Cinsamilla. These farms required wells for irrigation, but digging wells was strictly regulated in Mexico. So what did they do? They bribed officials to get what they wanted. Meanwhile, the focus of drug prohibition became so intense in Florida, forcing Colombian cartels to find new shipment points. And Mexico became the next best option. The Guadalajara cartel had strong ties with the Cali cartel, one of Colombia's most powerful drug organizations, thanks to Juan Mata Ballesteros. With all the pieces in place, the Guadalajara cartel had the upper hand. The narcotics industry was thriving, and they were making billions each year. They had control over the drug trade in Mexico, using corrupt officials to advance their empire. But every empire has its downfall. At the height of his power, Felix Gallardo made a fatal mistake. And that mistake kicked off the very day he met with Enrique Kiki Camarena. Now the tension is high because there's a deep secret here. What happened to Kiki? On February 7, 1985, a group of armed men strategically positioned four to five cars outside the U.S. consulate in Guadalajara, Mexico. Their intention was hidden under their masked faces. As soon as Camarana stepped out of the consulate, these individuals, from the infamous drug cartel, swiftly seized him in broad daylight. They forcefully placed him into one of the cars and swiftly transported him to a nearby guest house. From that moment on, only his captors would lay eyes on him. However, before we delve into the circumstances surrounding his abduction, let's take a look at his life and how was roped into the web of this dangerous cartel. His life and career. 
Some people were not born with a golden spoon, but they fought tooth and bone to get one. Enrique Camarena was one of those men. He was a man whose life journey was filled with challenges and determination. Born on July 26, 1947, in the border city of Mexicali, Mexico, Camarena's family made their way to Calexico, California, when he was just a child. It wasn't an easy road for them, facing poverty and the hardships that came along. Growing up, Camarena had three brothers and three sisters. Tragically, his oldest brother Eduardo joined the Marines and lost his life while serving in Vietnam back in 1965. Another brother, Ernesto, faced his struggles, including brushes with the law and drug issues. Despite the tough circumstances, Camarena managed to graduate from Calexico High School in 1966, proof of his determination and resilience to get himself the golden spoon. After completing high school, Camarena enlisted in the Marines. As soon as his service ended in 1970, he returned to Calexico and joined the local police department. From there, he embraced a new path, moving to undercover narcotics work as a special agent on the Imperial County Narcotic Task Force, ICNTF. The establishment of the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, in 1973, opened up opportunities for Spanish-speaking agents, and both Camarena and his sister Myrna joined the agency that year. Myrna served as a secretary, while Enrique became a special agent in the DEA's Calexico resident office. It was a significant step for Camarena, setting him on a course that would shape his life. In 1977, Camarena moved to the DEA field office in Fresno, where he immersed himself in undercover operations targeting smuggling activities in California's San Joaquin Valley. He possessed a natural talent for the gritty world of covert work, effortlessly adopting different accents and street slang to blend in and gather vital information. His colleagues admired his unwavering dedication and drive, even among the already highly motivated DEA agents. Then, in 1980, a close friend and colleague who had relocated to the DEA resident office in Guadalajara urged Camarena to consider applying for a position there. Foreign assignments were seen as crucial for career advancement within the DEA, and the Guadalajara office was experiencing a surge in activity, revealing the explosive drug trafficking era of the 1980s. By this time, Camarena was a married man with three sons. The promise of Guadalajara's pleasant climate, access to an American school, and a favorable exchange rate convinced Camarena and his family that a move to Mexico would bring them new opportunities and a brighter future. But little did he know that his journey would lead him to the heart of the drug trade, where his unwavering determination and relentless pursuit of justice would make an indelible mark in the fight against the dark forces that plagued society. Life of DEA Personnel When Camarena arrived in Guadalajara in the summer of 1980, little did he know that he was stepping on the toes of barons and powerful guardians of drug trafficking. There were several factors contributing to this alarming trend in Mexico then. Under the presidency of José López Portillo, the efforts to spot and eradicate drug plantations from the air, which had been endorsed by President Echeverria, were significantly reduced. In fact, American participation in these activities came to a halt in 1978. This change made it easier for drug producers to establish large-scale plantations, making it harder to verify if the areas had actually been sprayed. Furthermore, during the late 1970s and early 1980s, cocaine trafficking, led predominantly by Colombian smugglers, experienced rapid growth in the United States. Naturally, this became the primary focus of the DEA, leaving Mexican enforcement as a secondary concern. Camarena's investigations primarily centered around the extensive marijuana plantations that sprouted up in the early 1980s. The older plantations were typically hidden in remote mountainous regions, making them difficult to detect, while the new ones utilized a more advanced marijuana production technique called Sinsamilla, seedless. This superior quality product commanded higher prices in the North American markets. As solo overflights and undercover work were prohibited, DEA agents in Mexico had to focus on cultivating informants. This task was far from easy and became increasingly dangerous. However, Camarena excelled in this area. He possessed a charisma that could convince individuals to gather their courage and venture into uncharted territories. Camarena's exceptional work with an informant known as Miguel Sanchez led to the discovery of one of the new style plantations in 1982. Miguel developed a friendship with the man running the plantation, who disclosed that it was located near the isolated town of Vanagas, bordering the state of Zacatecas. According to Miguel's information, the main financier behind the plantation was cartel member Juan Jose Esparagoza Moreno. In August 1982, Camarena, along with Miguel, 
finally located the plantation. To confirm its significance, Camarena conducted two secretive solo overflights. Subsequently, he briefed Mexican authorities, who carried out a raid on the plantation in September 1982. The astonishing outcome revealed a plantation spanning over 200 acres and employing hundreds of growers. The Guadalajara DEA estimated that over 4,000 tons of Cincinnati marijuana were destroyed, making it the largest plantation discovered at that time. Enrique Camarena's relentless pursuit of justice and his ground breaking discoveries were just the beginning of a tumultuous and gripping journey that would forever leave its mark on the fight against drug trafficking. The headlines were ablaze, and every newspaper cover showcased the heroic efforts of this agent. The authorities were ecstatic, while the cartels raged with anger. It was like a high-stakes game of cat and mouse, and Camarena was right in the middle of it all. Then, in 1984, the situation took a dramatic turn, which became the last straw that broke the camel's back. A massive marijuana farm called Rancho Buffalo in Ande Chihuahua was wiped out by 450 Mexican soldiers. Rumor had it that the DEA had provided the tip-off, and it was highly likely that Camarena was behind this epic raid. Can you imagine the outrage from the Guadalajara cartel? They had lost billions of dollars to the authorities, and now they were determined to find the DEA agent responsible for this devastating blow. But hold on, there's more to this fascinating story. Shocking new evidence has emerged, suggesting that El Chapo, the notorious drug lord, tortured and killed seven Americans. But how on earth is he getting away with these murder? It seems like, at this point in history, Guadalajara had become a perilous place for DEA agents and almost any American who crossed paths with the cartel. They were on a ruthless hunt for the person behind their plantation's downfall, targeting anyone in sight. Let's rewind a little back to the winter's day when Benjamin and Patricia Muscarinas arrived in Guadalajara. They had come to work for a wealthy Mexican family, driven by their faith as Jehovah's Witnesses. Eager to spread their beliefs, they invited their friends Dennis and Rose Carlson, also devout Jehovah's Witnesses, to join them in their mission. Together, the four friends embarked on a door-to-door -door campaign, handing out pamphlets and engaging in conversations with anyone interested in learning more about their religion. They were determined to make a difference, but little did they know that their path would cross with a man named Ernesto Carrillo, a person they should have never encountered. On that fateful day, December 2nd, they unknowingly knocked on Ernesto's door. Fear consumed him, and he believed they were undercover DEA agents. Without hesitation, he ordered his men to kidnap them. The friends were whisked away to a remote ranch outside Guadalajara, where an unimaginable horror awaited them. To their horror, they found themselves in the clutches of Joaquin Guzman, famously known as El Chapo. Known for his love of bloodshed, El Chapo reveled in their suffering. The friends endured unspeakable acts of violence, beatings, and torture as their lives hung by a thread. Eventually, they were brought before a massive, freshly dug grave. One by one, they were shot dead, their lives senselessly taken away. It was a heart-wrenching tragedy that remained shrouded in darkness for years. Their deaths were hidden until fast forward to 2018, when three former Mexican state police officers bravely came forward to share their eyewitness accounts of the massacre. These officers, who had been assigned as bodyguards for the cartel, knew the risks of speaking out, yet they chose to shed light on the truth. But the terror didn't stop with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Another innocent American, journalist John Walker, had unknowingly ventured into the cartel's territory. He had traveled to Guadalajara to find inspiration for his murder novel, completely unaware that he was about to become entangled in a real-life nightmare. Arranging to meet his friend Alberto Radalat at a seafood restaurant, little did John know that the establishment was owned by the cartel and reserved for their private affairs. When approached by one of the officers, John and Alberto were told the restaurant was closed. However, their American accents caught the attention of Gato Quintero, who ordered them to be brought inside. Once inside, they were led to a secluded room where El Chapo himself awaited. The torture began, with ice picks used to inflict unimaginable pain. Under duress, one of them falsely admitted to being a DEA agent, hoping to end the torment. But their fate had already been sealed. El Chapo ordered them to be taken to La Primavera Forest, a notorious mass grave used by the cartel. There, John met his tragic end, his life extinguished in an instant. Alberto, however, faced a more horrifying fate. Buried alive, his voice silenced forever. The cartel's killing spree of innocent Americans continued, fueled by the relentless pursuit of their true target. The chilling question remains, who was the man they were truly after? His kidnap and murder. 
The cartel soon discovered that the man they were after was none other than Kiki Camarena. Caro Quintero immediately ordered his kidnapping, and he had the assistance of corrupt officers from the Mexican Intelligence Agency, DFS. The incident took place on February 7, 1985. On that fateful day, Kiki left the United States consulate with plans to meet his wife for lunch at their beloved restaurant, the Camelot. Little did he know that a man flashing a DFS badge would approach him, claiming that higher-ups wanted to see him. Kiki, following protocol, insisted on informing his supervisor first. But to his surprise, several other men emerged and forcefully pressed a gun against his ribs. They shoved him into the back seat of their vehicle and whisked him away to a large house at 881 Lopez de Vega. Upon arriving at the house, Kiki found himself surrounded by a scary scene. About 50 to 80 people, including politicians, government officials, and narcos, were rejoicing in the kidnapping of the agent. Kiki was imprisoned in the guest house, where he endured relentless questioning about Ranch Buffalo, his informants, and his knowledge of other plantation sites. For two agonizing days, Kiki was subjected to unspeakable torture. He was mercilessly beaten, burned, and even had men stomping over his back and chest. The autopsy revealed numerous severe injuries, but it was difficult to determine whether they were inflicted before or after his death. The emotional toll of this horrifying ordeal is unimaginable. Kiki, a dedicated DEA agent, was betrayed, abducted, and subjected to brutal torment. His skull had been pierced by a piece of rebar, and his ribs had been brutally broken. It is difficult to comprehend the immense pain and suffering he must have endured during his final moments. Camarena's lifeless body was wrapped in plastic and discarded in a desolate rural area outside the small town of La Angostura, in the state of Mikoacan, the discovery of his remains on March 5, 1985, brought a devastating end to the desperate search for the courageous DEA agent. The sight of Kiki's lifeless body, discarded and hidden, serves as a chilling reminder of the cruelty and disregard for human life that can exist in the darkest corners of our world. It is a tragic testament to the sacrifices made by those who dedicate themselves to fighting against the forces of evil and corruption. Investigation the brutal torture and murder of Kiki Camarena ignited an immediate and determined response from the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA. The murder caused significant outrage and pressure from the U.S. government on the Mexican government to find and bring the perpetrators to justice. The U.S. temporarily shut down the border with Mexico, which had a severe impact on Mexico's economy. In a bid to bring justice to their fallen comrade, they launched Operation Leyenda, a legendary undertaking that would become the largest homicide investigation ever conducted by the DEA. A specialized unit was swiftly dispatched to Mexico to coordinate the investigation. Shockingly, it soon became apparent that high-ranking Mexican government officials were implicated in the heinous crime. Past director of the Mexican Federal Judicial Police, Manuel Ibarra Herrera, and former director of Interpol in Mexico, Miguel Aldana Ibarra, found themselves under suspicion. As the investigation intensified, three key individuals emerged as prime suspects. Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo, and Rafael Caro Quintero. Under mounting pressure from the U.S. government, Mexican President Miguel de la Madrid took swift action, apprehending Carrillo and Quintero who were charged and slammed with a 40-year prison term. However, Thanks to political protection, Felix Gallardo remained elusive. The pursuit of justice extended beyond Mexico's borders as the United States government launched a relentless investigation into Camarena's murder. At the end of the day, Caro Quintero's sentence was cut short in 2013, leading to his release, although he later went into hiding. He was recaptured in 2022 by the Mexican Navy. The involvement of the CIA in Camarena's murder has been the subject of speculation and conspiracy theories, suggesting that the agency may have had a role due to its connections with drug trafficking and the Nicaraguan Contra rebels at the time. However, definitive evidence supporting these claims has not been established. Overcoming the challenges of extraditing Mexican citizens, the DEA went to extraordinary lengths even detaining Humberto Alvarez Machain, the physician accused of prolonging Camarena's agony during the torture. Bounty hunters were employed to bring Alvarez and Javier Vasquez Velasco to the United States. The Mexican government vehemently protested these actions, but the DEA pressed forward. Alvarez was brought to trial in Los Angeles in 1992. However, much to the disappointment of many seeking justice, the judge ruled that there was insufficient evidence to secure a guilty verdict. 
resulting in Alvarez's release. In a surprising turn, Alvarez filed a civil suit against the U.S. government, claiming that his arrest violated the U.S.-Mexico extradition treaty. The case eventually reached the U.S. Supreme Court, which ruled against Alvarez, denying him relief. Meanwhile, four other defendants, Vasquez Velasco, Juan Ramon Mataballesteros, Juan Jose Bernabe Ramirez, and Ruben Zuno Arce, brother-in-law of former President Luis Echeverria, faced trial and were found guilty of Camarena's kidnapping. Zuno had well-established connections to corrupt Mexican officials, indicating the depth of the corruption involved. Also, Mexican officials themselves faced allegations of covering up the murder, with reports surfacing that evidence on Camarena's body had been deliberately destroyed by Mexican police. The intricate web of corruption, political protection, and the relentless pursuit of justice created a dramatic backdrop to the aftermath of Camarena's tragic death. The battle to expose the truth and hold those responsible accountable would continue to unfold, revealing the disturbing extent of the collusion and cover-up surrounding this dark chapter in history. His legacy lives on. In November 1988, Time magazine recognized the significance of Kiki Camarena's life and tragic death by featuring him on its cover. During his time with the DEA, Camarena received numerous awards for his exceptional service. Even after his passing, he was posthumously honored with the Administrator's Award of Honor, the highest accolade bestowed by the organization. In the city of Fresno, California, the California Narcotic Officers Association, CNOA, pays tribute to Camarena's memory by organizing an annual memorial golf tournament named after him. The CNOA also presents a scholarship each year to graduating high school seniors. Camarena's impact is further reflected in his hometown of Calexico, California, where a school, a library, and a street proudly bear his name. The Enrique Camarena Jr. High School, part of the Calexico Unified School District, opened its doors in 2006, providing a lasting tribute to his legacy. In Mission, Texas, the Enrique Camarena Elementary School, part of the La Jolla Independent School District, was dedicated to him in 2006. One of the most significant nationwide initiatives inspired by Camarena's memory is Red Ribbon Week. This annual event, held in schools across the country, aims to educate children and young people about the importance of steering clear of drug use. It serves as a powerful reminder of Camarena's dedication to the fight against drugs and his ultimate sacrifice. To ensure that Camarena's legacy continues to make a positive impact, the Enrique S. Camarena Foundation was established in 2004. Led by Camarena's wife, Mika, and his son, Enrique Jr., the Foundation's board of directors consists of former DEA agents, law enforcement personnel, family members, friends, and individuals who share a commitment to preventing alcohol, tobacco, drug abuse, and violence. As part of their ongoing drug awareness program, the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks honors law enforcement officers who actively combat drug-related issues by presenting them with the annual Enrique Camarena Award at local, state, and national levels. In 2004, the Calexico Police Department created a memorial within its halls to honor Camarena's service and sacrifice. This memorial stands as a constant reminder of his dedication and serves as a source of inspiration for those who follow in his footsteps. The impact of Kiki Camarena's life and untimely death has been explored in several books. One notable work is O Plata O Plomo, The Abduction and Murder of DEA Agent Enrique Camarena by James H. Kikendall, a retired DEA resident agent in charge. Additionally, Roberto Saviano's non-fiction book 000 delves into Camarena's undercover work and the tragic events that unfolded. Through these various forms of recognition and remembrance, Kiki Camarena's name lives on, serving as a witness to his courage, dedication, and the ongoing fight against drug abuse and violence. Truly, posterity will never forget this true legend. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.